Peter Stinkist is a professor of computer science and of electrical and computer engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. His current research is in the areas of future internet architecture and wireless networking. And I'm actually very excited to see the talk, so I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So, um, so yes, yeah, so uh, I've been working in networking since uh, late uh, uh, 80s, okay? And uh, so I've uh, worked on a lot of different projects, some of them on the long time horizon. So you're looking at things that, like, at least 10 years down the road that anybody would even consider using this. This is an example of this type of research. I've also had a lot of projects with a shorter uh, time horizon, and so I'll be happy to talk about these offline. So this is a project that's funded by the National Science Foundation, started in 2010, and is kind of uh, in its last uh, legs now. It's a large project. Uh, I've listed all the principal investigators here. Most of them are in networking. There are some people in uh, top areas, such as uh, engineering and public policy, which is looking at things like economic implications of decisions you make inside the network. Uh, HCI, looking at things like uh, privacy implications for network architecture and so on. So let me give a little bit of a motivation here. So this is uh, one of two slides that are a little bit like a lecture. Um, so obviously you're familiar with the IP protocol, but uh, IP protocol has a very unique position in the network stack uh, in the sense that it, it kind of sits right in the middle there, uh, almost. And uh, so one of the things it does is that it kind of separates the top of the protocol stack from the bottom of the protocol stack. And this is sometimes referred to as kind of an hourglass model where uh, you know, you kind of get these two pieces of the protocol stack, and because they're separated by this very narrow and simple protocol, they can evolve independently. So the way I, I you may, so most of you have probably seen this particular representation, but some of you may have not have. So the thing that's really unique about this is that you can effectively have computer science types do their stuff without knowing anything about what goes on below. Okay, and you are at least if you're in your wireless for a second. And then, uh, same thing, electrical engineers can then go off in the wild without knowing anything about what's going on in top. Okay, and so this is at a very low level. And so I'll refer to this as kind of evolvability. You can evolve the two parts of the protocol stack more or less independently. Now, I would have to, I, and I think a lot of people agree, and you may disagree, uh, argue that this kind of concept that's sometimes referred to as a narrow waste has really been the key to the success of the internet. And the obvious one is obviously the evolvability already, right? Because what it has allowed us to do is to get dramatic changes both at the physical layer and the network layer, okay? So for the people who've been around for a while, you've obviously seen this unfold in front of your eyes. But also what we're seeing is that uh, obviously the types of applications we're running going from FTP all the way to, you know, the types of things we, we run today, like Facebook, social networks, e-commerce, and so on. Um, and so, um, the problem, of course, is that at the same time, this narrow waste has actually also become a little bit of an obstacle, and that's kind of what I want to focus on today. So the first one is security. I think the original internet really was not concerned with security so much, because pretty much everybody knew each other, maybe not in the internet, but in the dark internet. Um, and the second one is really that the, the entire internet kind of uh, presents a host-to-host -host model. Okay, I want to talk to FTP to this host, email, send a message, and the server runs on this host. That's kind of the types of commands we used to type in. Uh, but today, obviously, nobody cares about hosts. Most users probably don't even know there's computers in the internet, right? They're, all they see is the web. And, um, and so what that means is that there's kind of been this, this process of adding layer and layer of indirection on top of this host-based communication to make the system support these applications. Okay, and so what, what the focus of this particular project is, was basically to see whether we can kind of add some things to the, fit, to the network layer that would deal with two problems. One of them is security, realizing, of course, that security is much broader than just the network layer. In fact, you know, one can have an interesting discussion on whether the network layer should even be part of it. And the second one is evolvability, just kind of pushing, extending the evolvability, not just to the top of the protocol stack and the bottom of the protocol stack, but also this middle layer. Can we evolve the middle layer, the, the IP layer? So this is a very unusual project. There are, I'm not, I'm not really aware of too many projects that are even touch on this particular question. So here's a little bit of an outline. I'll, go, I'll give an overview of XIA, which is kind of a standard overview I've given to a lot of people. It's going to look a little bit abstract, but then I'll talk about uh, the, the, that, that was uh, the, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about our implementation. 
<coughs> and implementation issues. I'll present some use cases and also talk a little bit about lessons learned. Use cases, uh, you think about this as things that went right, and then lessons learned as things that maybe didn't go quite right. Okay? And so again, this was funded by NSF, which I'm uh, uh, actually uh, uh, funded several projects of this type. So, um, XIA ultimately as an architecture is probably not all that important. Uh, what is important is that there are three ideas that feed into XIA. And I think these three ideas is really where our research focuses. However, if you want to evaluate these ideas, you need a network, okay? And so, so we combine these three ideas and kind of turn this into a network architecture. So the first idea is actually very simple for people more of a computer science type of background. Why is it that we can only send packets to hosts when in reality, no application actually cares about hosts other than things like monitoring tools and diagnosis tools and so on, okay? And so how about if we have typed addresses where you can have an address type that is for hosts, an address type that's for content, an address type that's for services, whatever you make up, okay? And there's an assumption here, as I'll explain later, that the network will actually kind of be able to hand back, handle packets differently depending on what you contact, okay? I'll have examples of how that works later. The second one is the weird one, okay? So that's going to take a little bit of uh, explanation to wrap your head around this. But it turns out that the moment you have multiple types of addresses, you, you just uh, you know, have created problems for yourself. Because how can you make sure that every router in the internet, in the internet understands all types? Especially when you start to introduce new types, right? So you're now going to have routers that say, well, wait a second, I'm, you know, I was only updated two days ago and you introduced a new type, what am I going to do now, right? And so I introduced a concept called fallbacks, which I'm not going to try to explain here by waving my hands, but I'll explain this later using the slide. And then the third thing is that we added a little bit of a, a basic, very primitive form of security at the network layer, which is called intrinsic security. And it allows gives you a very simple property. You can basically check very efficiently whether you're actually talking to the right party and exactly how we define right party. I'll actually explain that later as well. So these are the three ideas that we're going to combine. So let's start um, with the uh, multiple principal types, which is the easiest one, I think. The idea is the following. Uh, every address has a type. So literally, you look at the bits and you'll see that later. First part of the address says type field, and then there's a bunch of other bits that say give effectively the, the identity, identify something of that type, okay? So to make this more concrete, we still have host types, because ultimately there are still hosts. Uh, and so they represent basically something that looks like a host or an interface, depending on exactly how you interpret it. So what that means is that if a network sees a packet of this type, it kind of does what IP does to that. The second thing we have is we have uh, service identifiers. Okay, or service addresses, if you wish. So what that means is I want to talk to a service. And you can think of a service almost like a socket, right? A service can be a socket like an, uh, an ephemeral socket that's just used, you know, short, short, short term by a client. But it could also be like port 80 of Google uh, or port 80 of Facebook or port 80 of whatever. You know, they can be well-known service addresses. And these, uh, these things are meant to be globally unique, as I will explain uh, later. And so the idea here is that uh, you basically want to talk to that service, right? And so there's obviously a little bit of a challenge how you do this, given the scale of the internet, but there are a number of techniques that we use for that. And then finally, we have something called a content identifier, which identifies a piece of content. It's effectively like a file or a web page or something like that, okay? And so, what that basically means is that if the network sees a packet, the client is asking the network to get that piece of data. So it's kind of an example of content-centric networking. Okay? And, uh, and so the, the nice thing about this is that if you have caches in the network, potentially this, there can be a copy of this particular piece of content anywhere in the network. Okay? And so what you're effectively telling the, the, the network, what the client is telling the network, Please get me this piece of content. I don't care where it comes from, okay? Just get me the content. And it turns out that this intrinsic security that I mentioned earlier will then allow the client to verify the content is in fact correct, okay? So it, it doesn't care where it comes from anymore. All it really does is it wants to verify that the content is correct. So that's kind of the third idea. 
And so what that allows you to do is caching inside the network at the network layer, which is different from what we're used to. We're do used to doing caches, let's say web caches, which are so in some sense application specific, and this allows you potentially network layer caches. Um, I'll talk about, I'll give examples of these later, so if this sounds abstract, then that's okay. Um, and so the important, the final point here is, the idea is to get to the evolvability is that you can add types over time. And we've done that, and I'll give you examples later. So the idea is if you come up with a new type of destination where it would be useful if the network handled the packets differently, you just introduce a new type. Right, so we have like an 8-bit type field, that should last us for at least a little while. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the general idea. Now let me get into the second thing is, which is, okay, what happens if somebody introduces a new type? Okay, let's let's say a standards organization, for 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 uh, for example. Then you know we all know it takes a little while before this gets you know propagated throughout the entire internet. You need to update all the routers, for example, and so you end up with what I think of as a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Okay. You're writing applications, and now we use this new type field. Well, that's problematic because now that may fail because there may be some routers that don't recognize this type, and your packet gets dropped, right? Alternatively, how do you convince your manager at a networking equipment manufacturer to support this type if there are no applications that use it? Okay, so this is kind of a chicken and egg problem. And so, obviously, you can't shut down the internet and update all the routers, we know that. And so the solution we came up with is actually relatively simple. So I'm going to explain this using an example. Suppose that yesterday evening, when I was driving home from the airport, somebody standardized a new type field, which is called content identifiers. Okay? And so some people attended the standards guidance meetings, and they know they exist, so they include it in their packet. They start to send packets using the content identifier today. And obviously the problem is that none of the routes were updated overnight. Okay, so your packet hits the first router and it gets dropped and you're in trouble. So what we're doing instead is to say, look, addresses, thinking of addresses as just being some, uh, the identity of the endpoint is a bit narrow-minded. How about if we think of, oh, oh, that's complicated. Okay, so what about if we think of addresses as basically <coughs> explaining to the network how you find that particular, in this case, piece of content. It, it provides a, a means of reaching the destination. It's a little bit like sending a letter. You don't just write the name of the person, you actually provide an address which explains to the postal system how it can deliver the letter, okay? So in this particular case, what we do is we create an address shown in red, which has two parts. The first one is the content identifier. We call this the intent, because the intent of this packet is to retrieve that content. But we have what we call a fallback, which is a second part, which consists basically um, of what's, what you can think of of the equivalent of an IP address. Okay, so it identifies a server that is guaranteed to have this content. Okay, so NID stands for network identifier and HID stands for host identifier. So the way this now works is the following. When a router receives a packet, it looks at the intent. If it recognizes the intent, it will act on it. It will say, this is content. I will find the closest place that has this content may not know where the content is, or it may not recognize content identifiers, it doesn't matter. What it does is if it rec doesn't recognize or cannot handle the first part, it looks at the second part and says, okay, I'm going to deliver it using the address of the, of the origin server for this content. And so, even if there's a sing not a single router in the internet that understands CIDs, the packet will in fact be delivered to the origin server, and the content will be returned. So it's kind of like a safety net if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so, so that's basically our notion of supporting uh, uh, scalability, uh, uh, evolvability, and in some sense, more generally speaking, it's a way of making the network more robust. Okay, so now we're at a university, we're big on students, you put this in the hands of students and ask them to think of ways of implementing this. Well, we have somewhat creative students here. They ended up saying, look, the best way to do this is to use uh, DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. Okay, so this is not exactly the obvious choice for an address format, but it turns out to be quite, uh, quite interesting in this case. Um, whether you use DAGs or not is actually less important than kind of understanding the concept of fallbacks, which are actually quite critical in our architecture. So let me explain how this works. Think of an address as consisting of a DAG. 
So there's a root node in black, so the source, that's where you start. And then there's a single leaf node, which is effectively, well, leaf is maybe the wrong word here, but there's a, a single endpoint, which is the intent, which is the content. That's what you want, and there's an arrow between them. Okay? And so when a router uh, receives this packet, it starts at the origin, the black, and it follows the arrow and it says, CID, you want to retrieve this content. If there are caches along the way, you can basically grab it from those caches and uh, get the content faster. Okay, so that's the general idea. Now, if a router doesn't understand the, content, the CID for some reason, then basically, whoops, oh, it doesn't show that, okay. Uh, then you basically have the fallback, and this is basically implemented as follows. You basically have a network identifier followed by a host identifier. So what will happen is the, the router will look at the black dot, follow the solid arrow, which is the, the first priority arrow. If that succeeds, it looks for a content and delivers the content if it can. Otherwise, if that fails, it basically looks at the second dashed arrow, which is the second priority path. It sees a network identifier and says, hey, this is a prefix. I know about this. And it's going to deliver the packet based on the prefix, or forward the packet more precisely, based on the prefix. And then once you are basically reached the destination network, let's say CMU, then you're going to also use the host identifier to deliver to the host. Okay? So we're using effectively DAGs, and I'll use some DAGs to explain this. The reality is just fine for most cases to think of this as an intent way of reaching the destination, which is a direct way, and then kind of a fallback way, which is kind of an alternative, safe, or potentially slower way of fulfilling the, uh, the intent. Okay? So because I think all the examples I have exact, effectively exist of these two separate paths. And I'll give you some examples later. And then finally, the, the thing I'll spend the least amount of time on is intrinsic security. So it turns out that all these identifiers that I have are in fact cryptographic identifiers. So they're not just numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or like AS numbers or whatever, um, but they're basically cryptographic identifiers that can be used to verify that you're really talking to the right entity in the network. I'll give you just one example, two examples that I will use through, uh, later in the talk, and I'm not going to mention any others. The first one is for a host. The uh, identifier for a host is basically a hash of, the pu of a public key associated with the host, and obviously as part of a public-private key pair that is associated with the host. What that basically allows you to do is that if you receive a packet from this host, you can now challenge this host and say, hey, do you really know the private key for this? Right? Because you have basically the identifier in the packet as a, as a hash of the public key, and you can challenge the host and say, sign this with your private key, so you can really make sure that this packet was sent by, the, by that particular host. Okay? This is not our work. This was previous work done by Dave Anderson and, and collaborators. Uh, it's called the protocol, which is called the, uh, the Accountable Internet Protocol. Okay? So it allows you to verify that a packet that you receive claims to be from a certain host is in fact from that host. Okay? The second example that I can give uh, that I will use is that for content, the, um, for, content the for static content, the, uh, ha the identity of the content is a hash of the content itself. You, you look at your content, it's a big bit string, you just take a hash over that and you use that as an identifier. Okay? So it uniquely characterizes that particular string uh, because we're using, uh, you, you can use any size identifier, but they, it's good for them to be big enough to be globally unique. Okay? So those are kind of the three concepts. Now, before I start to give you examples, I'm just going to have this somewhat uh, weird interlude here, which says, okay, well, it's nice, well, at least that's what I think, and, um, um, or at least it's interesting. But now there's four questions that are asked. The first one is, can you really build a network out of this? Okay? The second one is, is this really too complicated to be practical? There's then a question of whether this actually works. And there's finally a question on whether this is a real network. So, does, can we build it? Well, yes, we can. So we have a complete prototype that's available on GitHub. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But the uh, main purpose of this slide is really twofold. The first one is, if you look at it, the first version, which is this represents, it kind of looks a little bit like an IP protocol stack. You know, we have a physical layer, we have a data link layer, we have a network layer, transport layer, we have sockets, uh, and then we have things like uh, kind of uh, ICMP lookalike and uh, ARP lookalike, we have routing protocols, we have all that good stuff that you're familiar to see. So in a first order approximation, 
you can, you can engineer a network based on this architecture that you know, kind of looks the same way maybe. The second thing is that um, as of, since we're in university, the first prototype of this, which, is, which this kind of reflects, was built entirely by students. Um, and then later on, we actually had some uh, professional programmers who came on board who helped out uh, a lot by basically making this more stable and more mature. Actually, one of them, Nitin, I can't see from here, but that's uh, one of them is here, Nitin Gupta. Um, and then the, the, uh, uh, the other one, Dan Murray, is actually on a, on a plane flying to Pittsburgh. And he may be here, I guess, uh, tomorrow. Um, and so their, their role has really been in kind of making this more bulletproof, taking modules from students, adding modules that we needed and, and we didn't have students to uh, implement and so on. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this prototype later. The second thing is, is this complicated? Well, I have to admit it is obviously a little bit more complicated, but the uh, network technology, ha uh, no, uh, computing technology has evolved a bit since the 70s. So in some sense, you can handle more complex things today than we could at the time. So I'm going to briefly explain how we forward packets. The way it works is the following. A packet comes in. Um, there's a kind of a important point where you are in the DAG, which is marked by, by a, uh, an arrow or a counter in the, in the packet header. There's an identifier there, which you look at, and you say you look at the type first, because that's what tells you how to interpret this. If it is, for example, a network identifier, you forward the packet to an engine that is specific for network identifiers. It does a lookup. Since we're using cryptographic IDs, this is actually a flat lookup. There's no longer this prefix match or anything like that. It, that can either succeed or fail. For network identifiers, it better succeed, <laughs> okay, because you know, we're assuming that they're globally supported. Um, and then basically, uh, the, based on the forwarding's uh, outcome, if it is a not successful, then you go back to the beginning and you look at the next node in the DAG, the fallback node, and you try again. Okay? So let me pick uh, a CID, packet comes in, it's for a CID, you do a lookup, or, the, and, uh, or you, the classifier decides that it has no idea what CIDs are, it fails, it loops back, and it discovers that the fallback is a network identifier, it resubmits the packet to the network identifier engine, and so on. So every time when you introduce a new uh, uh, type, you just need to add one of these. Okay? And most of these, it turns out that all the ones that are shown there are identical. They're all flat lookups in a, in a, in a forwarding table. <laughs> okay? So it's not exactly hard. Now, where the magic typically lies is that you need routing protocols for these things. <coughs> and if you look at things like caches versus host identifiers, that's kind of where the difference lies, because hosts aren't replicated. Well, okay, maybe I shouldn't say this, but pieces of hardware aren't replicated, right? Presumably hosts have unique addresses at some level. Um, but caches uh, have content that is replicated, so the same content is going to show up in many locations in the Internet, and your routing protocol needs to make sense of that. Okay, so you cannot really use BGP uh, uh, very easily for something like uh, cache content, and you probably don't want to do that. So that's kind of how this works. So it turns out to be very, very modular, and the way I think of this is a very disciplined, it gives you a very disciplined way of adding new functionality to the network. Okay? Obviously, there's other ways of doing this, and obviously we can prove this is um, the best or good, or even, uh, but it, it does seem to work. Now, the, the second question is, does this actually, uh, you know, does this, does this actually uh, work? Can you forward packets? Well, okay, I uh, just want to uh, have a very simple slide here on how the internet works, you obviously know that. So we have packets that have a source IP address and a destination IP address. The IP address has, for the destination, has a prefix and a host ID at a very high level. Okay, this is what I'm looking for here. And so when you then forward packets, for the first leg, you use the prefix to get it to the right network, and you know these parts, right? And then the other part I want to point out is somewhere in there we have something like DNS, which is used by the client to retrieve the destination address. Now, how would you build a network with XIA? Well, I hate to be boring and repetitive, but it's kind of exactly the same if you're willing to do it in a simple way. So the difference is that we have actually a DAG, but it basically has a, um, actually I now realize that I have a color uh, mix up there, but the, um, <coughs> The network, oh no, the network identifier, then we have a host identifier and a service identifier. That is what our typical addresses in our current implementation look like. Service identifier is like the socket you're going to deliver it to, and it is literally the endpoint of the connection. Okay? The host is not the endpoint of a TCP session, it's, it's the socket. 
Um, so you forward the packets. Uh, first, you, um, you, uh, that's, this is where the mix-up of colors is. That should actually be the yellow. Okay? First, you're forwarding a packet to the destination network based on the network identifier. And then you basically deliver it to the right server and the right service using the host identifier and the network identity and the socket SID, SID, SID. Now the question I always get is, but how does the client create the DAG? The DAG is not a DAG, the DAG is an address. How does a client get an address? It uses DNS. Okay? So if you're if you're just saying, look, I'm, I don't want to be fancy, you know, I'm I'm in my first course on uh, networking, I want to keep it simple, you can do exactly the same thing as you do with IP. Now, obviously, this is, this is kind of boring, right? If you wanted to build an IP network, why don't we just use IP, right? So I'm going to give you some more creative ways of using these primitives later. And then the final thing is, is it a real network? Well, that's where Wireshark comes in, okay? So I think, uh, I think probably every network runs Wireshark, so we figured this one had to. So I, I believe the first implementation was actually done by a student uh, at BU, at Boston University. And then it was uh, extended and also updated for our implementation, which has different uh, types than the BU implementation. And it supports roughly the types of protocols I had on the previous slide. So kind of just to show this to you, this is, I believe, uh, an example of a streaming session, which uses at the transport layer TCP. I don't know whether you can read this. I actually can't, but, um, you know, I, well, actually I can. So this actually, uh, in the middle there, I don't think I need to interpret this for you, but in the middle there, it shows basically the destination DAG and the source DAG, and it's basically structured as a list of identifiers, and then the thing at the right, the one, two, one, two, and zero, basically is effectively says, these are the next nodes you can consider, right? Where the nodes are numbered zero, one, two, in this case, okay? If you hit the node, and the next node is zero, then you have reached the end of the DAG. That's the, that's the, that's the intent node, okay? The intent identifier. We also have um, more interesting ones. Oops. Um, so this is actually a DAG that is used for mobility, uh, which I will explain briefly later. So um, it's actually in the middle there too. Um, and uh, it's actually truncated because our addresses are big and I, we're assuming that Wireshark has a limit on the number of bits or bytes you can have in an address. And so we're, we're, we're exceeding this uh, big time for this particular DAG. So this is basically the way it works. The, the, the red is the intent path, and the green is the fallback path. Okay, I believe I got my colors right this time. And so this is basically how it works. I'll explain exactly what this DAG does when we talk about mobility. So we use Wireshark, and we actually use it uh, repeatedly. Well, usually maybe this is a little bit of an unusual application of it, but I'm sure you've seen weird ones. All right, so um, what are we doing here? Wow. Okay, so, um, so now what I want to do is talk a little bit about some use cases of XIA, which is basically um, looking at uh, 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 network challenges that uh, maybe not be that hard, but are a little bit tough for IT, okay, and see whether it's possible with XIA to handle these more elegantly or, or in a simpler way. So I have made a list here of the various things we've done. These are some of the more larger efforts. I'm not going to talk about all of these, as you can imagine, but one of them has to do with availability. We've actually introduced a number of new types of uh, uh, identifiers, and I'll mention some of them at the end if I have enough time. Network level caching, I'll actually have an example of that later. Incremental deployment of XIA, it's kind of a cute one because this is not something we expected to be able to do. Mobility, I will talk about, and then we also have things like service in a cast. Um, uh, we have, I have, we did something, this was done at Boston University, extreme evolvability, where they went really crazy, literally took the whole research papers and took the whole research paper and turned it into an identifier type and ended up really having a network that has an incredibly rich uh, network layer. And, uh, and then finally, uh, Adrian Perrick and his group um, uh, has a, a, a protocol which is a path-based forwarding protocol that can be used with IP and is actually he's, uh, pushing this uh, very hard and, and having quite a bit of success. We also actually uh, in integrated this into XIA, showing that you can even use path-based forwarding, right? And I can talk about what that means offline. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these, but not all of them. So <coughs> let's start with um, um, the um, content retrieval and caching. 
So there's two points. First of all, explain how caching works. I mean, that's the easy part. The second one is uh, showing that there's more, well, more than one way of retrieving content. So you can retrieve content using a content identifier, which I kind of already showed on an earlier slide. But that's actually not the way you need to do it or, or have to do it. The simplest way to retrieve content is actually to be boring, okay, and to use basically a host identifier, uh, a network identifier, which is the equivalent of an IP address. So what you're saying is, I want to retrieve content, a web page, and it has to come from this server, okay? So you go to the origin server, okay? And there's no, no caches, no nothing. It's exactly the way it happens in IP today, assuming you don't have some web proxy uh, uh, serving the content or a CDN. Um, a second thing you can actually do is say, look, most servers uh, or internet services are replicated. Let's assume they have three replicas, okay? We have an anycast SID which does kind of uh, do something like that. It is basically allows you to basically use a service identifier, an anycast service identifier as your destination, okay? And then what was going to happen is that the packet that will be sent the routers will decide uh, which of these service instances to use. So the simple example is, I'm in Europe, okay, and I want to access a web page. They have replicas in Europe, the US, and Asia, okay? And somehow the routers in Europe know that this particular package should go to the one in Asia. Oh, no, no, sorry, the one in Europe, okay? And so this is shown here, and in this case it's a little bit ambiguous, but you can imagine it's being arrived here, deleted here, uh, uh, served from here. Um, I don't have time to explain how it works, but it is actually kind of an, an unexpected way of doing this in the sense that you don't actually do routing, you actually do more uh, uh, service instance selection. And the decisions are entirely made by the service providers of the, of the service, not by the ISPs. Okay? Because things like load balancing, for example, play a role in this type of decisions. And obviously the ISPs can, don't know what the loads are on the servers in the, in, in the, the service provider. Okay, and so in this particular case, you can then also use uh, intrinsic security to know, make sure that you're talking to a legitimate instance of that service. Okay, and uh, so uh, again, I can talk about this offline. And then finally, you can do the thing you probably all expected, which is that you can uh, uh, basically rely on caches. If it's a very widely, uh, you can imagine it's a chunk of a very popular movie, for example, then you could potentially uh, retrieve it from any of hundreds or thousands or whatever caches on the internet, and the network can basically pick the one that is the closest, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the, what the logic behind this is later. And again, um, especially for movies, um, if the address identifier is a hash of the content, then obviously you can verify that, that the chunk you receive is in fact a legitimate chunk as a rather than being some fake uh, data in the same way. So that's kind of the way caching works. Okay? But you only get it if you use CIDs. Okay? And so I'm actually going to skip this um, to make sure I move forward. <coughs> the second example uh, is mobility. So this gets a little bit harder, okay? So um, mobility is a very well-studied problem. Um, and, but I don't know how much people in the audience have uh, considered this. So let me briefly explain this. Mobility, there are two problems. The first problem is that if you are a client and you want to copy contact a device that's mobile, which effectively means it runs a service of some kind, okay? Then, um, you know, and it's mobile, then where is it, right? Um, the second thing is that if you are actually in an active communication session with another party and you are mobile, then how do you keep this session going? Both of, them have, of these have been studied like crazy, okay? Um, and so, so there are solutions, but especially the ones for the for the first problem, tend to be somewhat messy, okay? They end up in RFCs that are, have like 200 pages, uh, in part because you need ways of making it secure. Um, so the fundamental problem here is that in the internet, the identifier of a host and its location, if you don't use overlays, are basically the same. So the locator, which is used to find the device, and the identity of the device are both represented by the IP address. So if you move to a new network, you get a new IP address, um, then you have a new locator, because there's, there's a, you need to use a different path to find you, but you cannot really change the identity of the device by move, just modifying its IP address, unless you have two IP addresses, which is what some of the solutions do, and then it gets a little bit messy. 
So what we're doing in XIA is that we're kind of ahead of where IP is in the sense that for a device, the identifier of the device is the HIP, which is the hash of the public key associated with the device, and the locator, which is used to find the device, the DAG. And the thing that's interesting about the DAG, it, it includes the identifier. Okay? So it's a, kind of interesting. You get, you get two for one in a way. Okay? So the, 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 the simple answer to dealing with mobility is actually very simple. As you move around, you keep modifying the DAG to reflect where you are, but the host identifier stays the same. So the, the endpoint you're talking to can always verify that it's talking to the right host because it has the HIV that is part of the address effectively. Right? Now address is ambiguous here, but let's, let's, uh, so let me say it's part of the whole game. So let me give you, uh, explain briefly how it works because this gets to the DAG that we, uh, we had a few seconds ago. Um, so, um, actually I think I can skip the animation here. Um, so let me first do the easy one. Um, <coughs> you have an, uh, an active session. Let's say that this is the old, this is the old DAG that was used to find the mobile device. So this is network identifier O. Okay, which is the network identifier of the old location, the host ID, which is not going to change, and the SID, which is the true endpoint of the connection, which is not going to change. Now, when you move to a new uh, location here, uh, you're going to have an NID N, which is a new network, so you move from CMU to PIT because you walked across the street, okay? And so now, this is the DAG you're going to have. And so the way you're going to keep your IP session around uh, or TCP session around, for example, is that the device that moves is going to effectively send a change of address uh, uh, record to the party it's, commu it's communicating with and say, hey, I'm at, this is my new address, and by the way, I'm signing this using my HID private key, so you can verify that this is a little legitimate change of address. Okay? So, um, so you, change, uh, charge it, you, you sign it using your private key of the host, you, you, you move it, uh, you, 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 uh, you include your, your public key, the other party can uh, verify that the public key is correct by picking its hash, comparing it with the host ID in the, in the address, and then it can basically verify the, the signature on the, on the, uh, on the uh, change of address record. So that's how you work this. This has actually been done before, this is not something we invented, this is based on a, on a paper. Uh, that does this as an, in, in effectively an overlay format for IP, where you use two IP addresses for mobile devices. Okay, so it's really very simple, and it leverages the uh, the IP address. The notion that you just modify addresses inside the network uh, of packets that traverse the network without actually having to worry about correctness, because you have this HID, is a little bit unusual, but it turns out to be actually useful in this case. The second thing. <coughs> Uh, second example is a little bit more elaborate. Uh, I've simplified the DAG, but the idea is really the following. Um, think of this as a very kind of uh, unusual way of implementing mobile IP, for those of you who are familiar with that. So, when a device is mobile, what it will do is its address that it will register with DNS, or that its home uh, registry, or, or home location, or home ISP is going to register with DNS, it's going to look something like that. What it will say is, look, the intent path is network identifier of the home network, followed by the HID and SID, okay, which are whatever the, uh, the, the, the host decides. And there's a fallback path, which basically says this is a network identifier for, uh, for a service, which is a rendezvous service, and an SID for that rendezvous service. And then that feeds back into the, uh, <coughs> the, the fallback, uh, the, the intent path there. So what's going to happen is the following. If the device is in its home location, its home network, this path will be followed through the DAG. You go, you go through the home network, the host will be there, you will be successful, and then you will have the SID. Okay? If you are not in the home network, then this step here will fail, and the router will use the fallback path and effectively forward the packet to some kind of a rendezvous service. Okay? This rendezvous service basically knows where you are, because the client continuously updates the, lo the rendezvous service about where it is. Okay? So then the packet will be delivered to the rendezvous service, which will say, okay, this is for host, because the address is the, the, the identifier is there. This is for host AI, HID, 
will walk up in its table, where is the host HID right now? It's in that domain. It will basically fix the address and forward the packet to the, uh, uh, fix this part of the address and forward the packet to the host. So let me explain how this uh, works using a figure. Packet is being sent, uh, th that's the rendezvous service. So the client continuously provides its correct uh, current network to the uh, rendezvous service. Then when a packet is sent to the home location, this will, the lookup, the, this step here will fail, the, the top arrow there. So it will be forwarded to the service uh, location. It will basically then forward the packet to the home agent by fixing the address. And then the device here will send a change of address similar to what I uh, uh, had on the previous slide to the client and say, hey, you know, uh, you should start, you should really change your address because this is where I am now. Okay, so it falls back to what I had on the previous slide. So is this perfect? Is this new? I don't really know exactly, but it's a lot simpler than anything I've read anywhere else. Okay? And you do get a level of security at the level of a private public key pair, which at least for some period of time should be, uh, should be fine. Okay? And so there's so many ways of changing those keys uh, uh, periodically as well. Okay. Um, how am I doing here? I'm actually going to uh, skip this one. Sorry. Um, one that I really want to point out, because this gets to the complexity issue, one of the things that's important uh, to, to, to remember actually is that the current internet is not a homogeneous network, okay? So I think you, you're all aware of this, but I kind of want to make this, uh, uh, emphasize this. Uh, the current internet is in fact very hom hom uh, heterogeneous. If you take a tier one ISP, it doesn't look at all like CMU campus network, okay? There's a lot more diversity in the types of infrastructure you have inside the, uh, uh, and, and how you forward packets and so on um, in, a, in a, let's say, a, a campus type network versus uh, the core of the internet. So uh, when you're looking at XI, deploying XIA, what we really envision is that uh, it can actually support this diversity in the sense that uh, to a large extent, your, your core internet routers are really only doing today forwarding based on prefixes. They don't worry about individual host addresses or any, any kind of fine print that may be present in the past, but they just forward back as fast as they can. So to a large extent, we expect that core networks will only support NIDs. Okay, they're not going to worry about caches for content. In fact, economically speaking, there would be a, 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 a very bad call. But then once you get closer to the edge, so you get the eyeball networks or the last mile providers, they may really introduce new services. So they're likely to support a richer set of XID types and then we expect a really more diverse, the most diverse set of uh, types being used in the edge of the network, right? And the fact that you can have these fallbacks that include an NID is what allows you to really get global connectivity uh, between these very diverse networks. Ultimately, as long as a sending network, a sender and a receiver, can agree on one XID type that they, that, that they share, even if nobody else in the world understands it, you can deliver the packet. Right? Which, is a, which is probably not the way you want to run the internet, but it is certainly, uh, it's feasible if that's what you want to do. <coughs> okay, so now I'm brief, I kind of want to wrap up, uh, I, I don't think uh, it's going to take much longer, a little bit with uh, kind of what, uh, uh, what, what worked well and, uh, and some things that we need to rethink. The first thing I want to point out is, is um, um, a very simple observation. The, uh, <coughs> uh oh, I actually somehow seem to pop. Okay, these are ours over. Okay, so the, uh, um, the initial XID types we had were host identifiers, service identifiers, and content identifiers. And the initial S uh, SIDs were only effectively, uh, did not have any, any cast capability, so they were unicast. Okay? Um, and so you look at this and you say, okay, all of them are effectively flat cryptographic identifiers. Either ha they're all hashes actually of something, okay? So, okay, and we know that the control plane is really where the difference lies. But, you know, are these are really kind of very similar? Are these really all the same or are they not, right? So the answer is they're actually, it turns out to be actually quite different. Uh, HIDs and SIDs are very similar, okay? In fact, you can almost use them interchangeably with some different trust assumptions. Uh, but it turns out that CIDs are actually very unique in that set, which is admittedly a small set. CIDs are special in two ways. The first one is that most, we expect that most CID lookups will fail. 
because there is so much content in the internet that realistically speaking, most routers will only know about a very small fraction of the content. Okay? But that's okay because we have fallbacks. Okay? And so the way you need to think of content identifiers is they're opportunistic. They're saying, look, I could get lucky, right? But you know, I know that we always we aren't always lucky. Sometimes you know life is just kind of real, right? And, and it doesn't work. The second one is that CID packets actually don't retrieve content. CID packets find a node that can return the content. Okay, and the, the, the packet that is returned for the content is, is it doesn't have a CID as a destination. It has a regular, typically a regular uh, network and host identifier as a destination. So the way to think about this is that CID are discovery packets. They discover nodes with certain content, uh, in this case. You know, they, 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 more broadly speaking, they discover nodes with certain properties. Okay? So that, that's actually, it turns out to be um, an interesting difference. In the, uh, so to, to kind of emphasize this, uh, this would give you a direct path. And then what happens here is that your CID packet will, among all these different sources, find one that is best using some metric of best. So it's a, there's a search criteria almost that is embedded in the content type that says what constitutes best for this particular uh, kind of multiple choice uh, destination, okay? And so, um, so that's kind of how CIDs works. To some extent, it gets reflected in the routing. Um, the example I always use is, a, is kind of a really bad one. Suppose I want to retrieve content, the origin servers in Chicago. Chances are you don't want to use a cache in Beijing, China. Okay, that would just delay a little bit over the over the uh, over the top. So in reality, what we uh, envision, and actually we have a few reverse implementation of this, which is actually very simple. We expect that content uh, uh, CIDs will only be advertised kind of in a certain radius uh, beyond. The, uh, uh, the cache itself, so it's not going to be propagated throughout the world, and this will be based on whatever the business arrangements you have with neighboring ISPs. Okay, so and I know that there's been actually there's protocols that already do that at the edge that are obviously based for uh, web web level caches. So the routing here is, you know, this is obviously different from let's say NID routing, which would use something like BGP. <coughs> so the um, and then you can basically. Um, you know, kind of get taught, find one of these CIDs, but there's, area, there's obviously going to be a lot of routers like here where they're not going to recognize the CID at all. Okay? So CIDs are different. Now it turns out that once we realize this, it turns out there's actually a lot of other discovery types that you can have with different search criteria. Okay? So if you now look actually at uh, content, in some cases, the, the notion that you have an, uh, that the content never changes, so you can calculate a hash that is unique forever, uh, that's, that doesn't apply to all content. Some content is more dynamic. So we have something called name CIDs, where, it's, where the identifier is based on the name. It's not based on the content itself. And then you're relying on a signature to verify the authenticity of the content. Okay? But it's a, it's a discovery packet, exactly like a CID. If you look at any cast SIDs, it's a discovery packet. It finds the instance that you really want to uh, of a service that is the best, and the search criteria are actually determined by the service provider that you're trying to contact, and not provided by the network itself in ways that I don't have time to discuss here. Okay? So it turns out this is this general content type. And so um, the, uh, the way um, we actually Actually, it looks like I didn't get them all in the right, quite the right order. Um, so the way that uh, we actually implement this in the first implementation, oh, actually, I'm sorry, now I remember why this is the right order. In the first implementation of XIA, this is basically how it was implemented, uh, and obviously Newton is very much aware of this. So we basically have uh, all of this implemented inside uh, click, which is the dashed arrow. So click is a, is a protocol implementation framework, which some of you may be familiar with. Not the fastest in the world, but very good for prototyping. And so we had the cache very tightly integrated with the XIA stack. We had kind of a content retrieval path, which kind of had its own transport protocol, which was effectively a datagram protocol. So what we had was that you send a CID request packet or discovery packet, then the node that received it, or the cache that received it, would return the content, which was assumed to be one packet. Okay? Now, um, we did this because this was implemented because we were preparing for a demo, and the students only had 
two weeks or whatever, so this was easy, and we didn't have any transport protocols at the time. So it turns out that uh, there are kind of two problems with this, which I elaborate on the next slide. First of all, you should imagine that serious caches are big, okay? And integrating them tightly with a forwarding engine is a kind of a bad idea, okay, from, uh, uh, for many reasons. The second one is most content is larger than your average data link packet, okay, by a wide margin, okay? So we were thinking for content identifiers that they would cover something like a video chunk, which is large, okay? We're talking hundreds of kilobytes, if not megabytes. <coughs> and so it turns out that this was not exactly ideal. Um, so what we ended up doing was um, effectively re-engineering this in the following way. <coughs> the client sends a packet for the content, okay? In the worst case, you have to go far, far away to the origin server, which may in fact be in Beijing, China. But you may get lucky, and there may be a nearby cache. Come on, show up. Okay, there you go. Um, and so the discovery packet gets sent to the nearby cache. This discovery packet doesn't say, give me the content, uh, send me one packet with content. What it effectively does is it basically is the first packet of establishing a stream, right? let's say a TCP stream, so it would be a SYN packet in this case. Then this SYN packet is basically being used to establish uh, a packet, an, uh, a uh, TCP connection with the client, and now you can stream the content, okay? So you may look at this and say, uh, so now the, the, what you've done is you've basically separated the discovery of the content from the actual delivery of the content, which means you inherit all the nice properties of TCP. For example, you get congestion control, which is definitely a nice thing to have, right? For example, because you get reliability and, and uh, flow control and all that good stuff. So what we've basically done is effectively said, look, we're doing discovery, we separate it, we increase modularity. On top of that, if you have actually a very small packet, you can still use data protocol on top of the CID packet. Okay? I, I, yeah, we have, don't have any users for this right now, but we potentially could. So what we've done here is, kind of based on our experience with this initial design, which was done in a hurry, uh, we've basically kind of separated the DBs. It now ex explicitly recognizes that a CID packet is just a discovery packet. It doesn't force you to return content, but it basically shows and says, oh, this, this client is interested in the content, let's establish a stream session and send the data, okay? So that's kind of how this works. Um, and so as part of this process, and uh, this was actually done by, the first version of this was done by a student, we've actually also moved the cache out, okay? So now it actually is a, a legitimate cache that has a separate uh, controller and backends and that type of stuff. And so now what really happens is that we have a, a, a content inter socket interface here which allows you to say, please get me this content. Underneath, it talks to the genuine transport protocols, okay? And so this is the, the solid one is the one we use. Um, the thing that's very interesting is that this notion here of basically using your discovery packet as a sync is not specific to CIDs. You can use it for NCIDs and potentially for things like Anycast and other types of functions, okay? So basically, the, 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 we've really kind of come to embrace this notion that some of these CIDs are different. They're just discovery packets, and then there's higher layers of the protocol stack that deal with the rest. So this is basically the end of the presentation. I, I uh, well, okay. Um, and I just want to kind of put up here the open source information. We have a, a pretty full-fledged protocol stack there. Not everything on there is fully integrated, but in the near future it should be. So, you know, you can literally bring up entire XIA networks and have fun with them. Um, and so if you, if you really have time on your hands, so we invite you to, uh, <laughs> to join us. And then there's a help list, and so you can talk to send mail to people like Nitin and Dan Barret to, uh, if, you, if you get stuck. Okay? Well, thank you for your uh, attention.